Yeah, we're at about 60, 70 participants, folks logging in. Bear with me for one second while we allow people to join the session. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Jason Morrison. I'm the president of the Pacific Institute and the head of the Seal Water Mandate which is a partnership between the Pacific Institute and the UN Global Compact focused on corporate water stewardship. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, water resilience and how we might align on measurement and metrics around basin resilience. The logos that you see here on this slide are the consortium of organizations that are partnering uh, to undertake this work. And we're going to have a 45 minute session today where uh, hopefully it'll be very uh, interactive uh, and we'll be able to shed some light on this topic and where we're taking the work. A few housekeeping remarks. Uh, one is this webinar is being recorded and it will be made publicly available. Just want everyone to be aware of that. We're going to ask that you use the Q&A function and not the chat function. We have uh, some uh, of my team members that will be trying to answer questions in real time. If we get a lot of questions, we may need to follow up with you after the session ends, but we'll endeavor to do so. Uh, and then thirdly, this is an interactive section. There's actually going to be polling questions. Um, the technology to answer the questions is quite easy. You don't have to get on your mobile phone. It will be a, a pop-up, a multi-choice uh, set of questions. Uh, although, um, be forewarned, the questions themselves are actually quite hard. But the good news is, if you get all four questions right, uh, you'll get a free subscription to the Pacific Institute's e-newsletter. You can email me on how you can receive your prize, uh, or uh, you can go to the Pacific Institute's website and see how you can collect that prize. Uh, next slide. Let's go for the agenda. Let me walk us through how we plan to do this. Um, I, I'm going to say a few more, uh, remarks that will uh, give context for this project and, and, and lay out a key uh, term that we will be using throughout the session. And then I am going to turn to a number of uh, my project partners. First, uh, Ashak Shapagain, who's going to talk about uh, the, the reason for this water resilience accounting framework and the theory of change that's driving. Then uh, we'll have Fred Boltz from a, a, a sorry, uh, Resolute Development Solutions that is going to talk about how this works builds on previous work around resilience by design and then walk through the, our current steps that we are thinking about for the Water Resilience Action Framework. And then we're gonna to pivot to two of the project partners that are gonna reflect a little bit on how this work builds on to existing efforts around water accounting and the metrics that are used for water management. That's Lisa Rabello from the International Water Management Institute. And then Colin Strong, who's gonna reflect a little bit on how water risk assessment currently uh, is done within the corporate water stewardship space. And again, how this uh, framework uh, adds on to supplements and fills gaps around. We'll have uh, a little bit of time for discussion around one of our polled questions. Ideally, we can take maybe one question from the crowd if time allows. And then our colleague, John Matthews uh, from the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation is going to spend a few minutes reflecting on what we've heard and maybe uh, uh, some ideas about what this discussion today might mean for the project team's work going forward. There will be one exit poll at the end that we'll also ask you to take before you sign off. Next slide, please. All right, so here's the first of the very hard questions. Let's pull it up. What is the work sector or industry that you represent. And I know many people here wear many hats. You're gonna to have to stay true to the essence of what you feel like today and pick an identity uh, and an organizational affiliation that you think um, most reflects uh, your presence on this seminar today. So choose one. It can be one of your alter egos, just whatever feels right for you today. All right, let's see if people have had enough time.
Let's see what the results are of this first survey. Okay, wow, across the range, um, quite a bit of, uh, of a spread here. That's actually quite interesting. Great, thank you for doing that. All right, let's move forward to the next slide. I'm gonna uh, lay out a few key concepts that um, will be important for everyone to align around. So the first is a working definition of water resilience. And um, here we're talking about uh, the ability of a water system by its design and operation to maintain its function and its service provision under stresses and shocks. And that's the first dimension as we think of as it relates to persistence. But resilience is also about uh, the water system adjusting uh, or in its configuration or its operation in order to sustain its function under change. This is the notion of adaptability. And then lastly, the ability of the system to transform uh, new functions a new normal when it's no longer gonna be possible to maintain uh, the existing uh, conditions. And that's what we would refer to as transformability. Now, when we think about basin resilience, um, we're thinking about uh, a situation where the services that are expected by stakeholders are available even when exposed to shocks and stretches, stresses such as climate change, extreme weather events, increased demand, et cetera. And here, as you will see, stakeholders, we also include the way that you would incorporate uh, the natural systems or natural environment, as well as vulnerable communities that may not actually uh, have voice at the, the water governance table at all times, but this notion of stakeholders encompasses them all. And one of the, the key premises of this project is that at the heart of measuring water resilience uh, at the basin level lies uh, a common understanding and a coherence among uh, water accounting metrics. So that's our starting point. Um, we don't have enough time in a 45 minute session to get into the detailed metrics themselves, but we talk about three categories or buckets of where these, uh, these metrics reside. One are the traditional water variables, flow, uh, storage, um, some of this uh, work that, you, that Lisa will talk about and that we have traditionally thought of in the water accounting space. There are also the metrics around the resilience of ecological variables, and Fred will talk a little bit about that. And then of course, also the way that we manage and govern uh, and implement uh, against policies and uh, objectives. And there's a set of variables around there that link back to the resilience of the system. And this project endeavors to come up with a accounting framework that supports consistent and coherent set of water accounts at all scales that can be used to assess basin level uh, water resilience uh, and the contribution of stakeholders individually and collectively toward resilience. So that's the undertaking that we are uh, uh, planning to uh, um, take on over the coming quarters. Next slide. So with this uh, setup, we wanted to get a sense of how uh, uh, the attendees on this call are thinking of their own approach to water resilience. So let's get the second question up uh, and I'll narrate it. So the first uh, is just not even really on the radar. You're not thinking about it, uh, heard about it, but it's not on your radar. The second is just grappling to understand, uh, starting to understand the issue of water resilience. The third I would characterize as um, beginning to do diagnostic work to understand risk and uh, assessing resilience. The third is more in the planning uh, stage of setting strategies and goals. Uh, and then uh, perhaps the most advanced would be those that are already implementing against uh, those programs and policies and objectives. So we uh, encourage you all to pick one of those that you think best fits where you uh, are on this continuum. All right, let's see if we, if we have enough results in.
Okay. Top vote getters are really in this beginning part of uh, starting to get get our heads around it and uh, and doing some risk assessment. That's helpful. And then quite a few on, on the call here, over 30 people who have uh, feel like they've already got programs and policies in place. Excellent. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. So now we'll turn our, our attention to some prepared remarks of our panelists. Uh, first one up will be uh, Ashok Shafagain, who's going to talk a little bit about this project, how we've come at the topic and our framework, our, our change theory around this effort. You're muted if you're talking, Asha. Yeah, thank you very much, Jason. Very nice introduction. Uh, let me quickly begin because we don't have enough time. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar. Uh, I wanna quickly take you through the journey of uh, the framework that we wanna develop here. Uh, I think when we talk about basin resilience, it is already in a stage of certain degree of resiliency is already there in the basin. It may be good, but it may not be good. Uh, and individual stakeholders are drawing from the resilience in the basin. The, the services, the functions from the basin is taken by the individual and their resilience depends on the basin resilience. So there is a kind of equilibrium right now at this moment in time, which is a static notion of equilibrium. So the, there is an equilibrium in the state basin resilience and it, it, individual stakeholder resilience. But once we have stresses and shocks, for example, climate change, uh, land use change, socioeconomical change, as soon as we start to have those kind of shocks and stresses, uh, the basin resilience would change to a certain level in, in the given the negative impacts of climate change on basin resources, uh, we might be ending in the negative zone or the impacted basin resilience could be different than the current resilience. So the function that the, the individual stakeholder is drawing upon would be different and they would have difficulties getting the same level of functions and the services from the basin. So their degree of resiliency would also change because of the impacted basin resilience. So comes the measures, the stakeholders measures. They would like to take measures. If they don't take any measures, they would end up having the, the poor basin resilience system, the same basin resilience system, which may not be helpful to all. And if individual stakeholder would take measures, some leading stakeholders would take measures, and they would take measures that would impact land use change, socioeconomic change, and environmental change as well, and also the new state of basin resilience will be achieved. But if there are many critical mass of stakeholders taking the right measures, they might have better basin resilience at the end of the day. And it's a dynamic process. It will again impact the land use change, socioeconomic change, environmental change, and so the cycle begins. And finally, if all the stakeholders would take right measures, then we would have desired state of basin resilience, which is actually the best thing to happen. Uh, it may be better than the existing basin resilience, it could be different, it may not be the same, but it could be better than the current state of resilience. And then it's an evolving target. So you can see that if one of these arrows would change, it would impact the whole system, this whole chain of reaction, and then the resilience would change. So it's a dynamic process. So thinking about the goals and targets in dynamic sense makes very much sense. So we need to have targets and goals set around evolving WRAF targets. WRAF stands for Water Resiliency Accounting Framework. We have given this short name here. And the new state of equilibrium with the stakeholder resilience. So in everyone's interest, we would like to end up high up in the desired state of basin resilience, whereas if we don't do anything, we might end up in the negative state of basin resilience. That's my two cents. I wouldn't take longer time. Uh, over to you, Jason. Excellent. Very clear, Ashok. Thank you. Um, so I've been uh, notified that Lisa calling in from uh, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, is uh, having internet issues. Hopefully, fingers crossed, Lisa, you'll be able to stay with us through this session. Uh, but first, uh, and if not, maybe we'll spend more time on the Q&A. Uh, we'll see how things unfold, uh, the joys of uh, virtual events. Fred, um, over to you to walk us through uh, really what this body of work, uh, the body of work that this uh, current framework is building on and how people can think about these categories of variables. Thank you, Jason. Thanks uh, for the kind welcome and, and uh, warm greetings, uh, colleagues and dear friends from the uh, World Water Week 
community. Good to be with you virtually. I hope that you and, and yours are healthy, safe, and, and well. Um, so the first key stage following upon uh, Ashok's good, good articulation of the theory of change for this work, the first key stage in our efforts to measure and manage for resilience is understanding and characterizing the system that we're managing and what influences its function, productivity, and ultimately its resilience under stress. And for water systems, this starts with understanding that the water system is a natural freshwater ecosystem that has been transformed and is continually transformed and managed by humans to meet our demands on the system. The majority of natural freshwater systems have been modified to meet human demands already, and that will be the, the state of freshwater systems for, for forever, effectively, as long as humans are managing this, this planet. And whereas historically we may have uh, addressed the engineered and ecological aspects of water systems separately, particularly in an era of global change, we must treat these elements as intimately coupled, interdependent, and we must steward these human managed ecosystems for resilience to uh, environmental and human driven changes. And this implies also understanding that changes in these key attributes, either ecological or social technological, have implications for the system as a whole, that changes in climate, in climate, in infrastructure, in stewardship behavior, influence the water system's function and service uh, collectively. And thus, individual actions have consequences across this interconnected system. Next slide. So these factors, both ecological and social technological, serve as control variables, if you will, or levers that can be modified and managed to strengthen or weaken resilience of the water system. Ecological attributes are reflected in three eco-hydrological dimensions fundamental to freshwater system function and resilience, and those include tempor temporal variability, environmental flows and pulses, spatial heter heterogeneity, so diversity of habitat and redundancy across the, the basin, and hydrological connectivity, ideally source to sea. Next slide. Social technological attributes or human modifications and management actions of the water system are also key drivers of resilience. And these include notably infrastructure, uh, operational actions influencing water temperature, flow, return flows, technologies, but also critically systems of governance and the collective behavior of stakeholders within the water system. So those very social aspects of how the water is managed uh, allocated, accessed, and governed is also fundamental to the resilience of the system as a whole. Next slide, please. So measuring the social, ecological, and technical factors that, that we just referred to enables us to answer the question, are the components, configuration, and relationships among those components that are necessary for resilience, are those in place? And to what configuration of those attributes is producing what level of system service provision, such for instance, water supply or stormwater regulation under normal conditions and under stress. So the critical step two of the uh, water resource accounting framework is to conduct that assessment and accounting of the state of the water system, the level and, and state of those key ecological and social technological attributes, and the service provision being provided by, this, by, by the system to stakeholders downstream. The next critical step really brings it to uh, decision-making and choice-making by stakeholders. This is where stakeholders articulate their priorities and expectations for the system, uh, and initial choices on system resilience to stress are articulated per an understanding of those expectations. Uh, notably, expectations of system performance, water supply under a protracted drought, for instance. Uh, what level of system water supply under drought are expected by the stakeholders dependent upon that water system? For instance, stakeholders may determine that 100% of water supply is required under conditions of drought, and that would inform then the design and management of the system and the cost of developing and managing that system uh, critically. It may also be that given cost, prohibitive cost uh, data, 
stakeholders decide that 70% of water supplies under a protracted drought is a, uh, a, a desirable outcome for the system and that, that the system should be designed for that degree of resilience. So this is the critical stage at which we have that interface with decision makers on current demands and expectations of the system and also an understanding of a willingness to accept cost of a highly performance system versus some, some other degree of, of, of lesser resilience, if you will. Next slide, please. So based upon stakeholder objectives for the water system, that last step uh, for its performance under stress, uh, the, the, the configuration of different components and operational decisions then informs the options that may be pursued in development and management of the system. That's step one then of this stress test, this resilience by design, uh, uh, performance-based optimization and stress testing process. The water system model, step two, at base and scale, portrays how the social, ecological, and technical uh, attributes interact with each other and with external stressors, climate, demography, economy, environment, uh, uh, influencing the system. And a resilient system to step three in this process is one that maintains its function and services under stress. So measuring the degree to which those expected functions and services are provided enables us to answer the question, is the system resilient to this stressor? And what degree of performance is, is provided under those stress, stresses that we anticipate? And the last step in this process then too is, is to conduct a stress test of the water system relative to critical variables influencing its performance, in this case, temperature and precipitation, to determine what types of configurations enable that resilience and to inform choice making, particularly related again to expectations of the system and cost. Uh, next slide, please. And then just quickly to wrap up, a lot of the concepts and methods in this, this talk, the, the preceding slides are featured in a water security special issue. So if you'd like more detail, please uh, dive in there. Um, Building Resilience Through Water is the name of the special issue and the, the, the articles that we cited are, are in there. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Fred. Uh, again, very clear uh, and straightforward. So now's the moment where fingers crossed. We'll see if Lisa still has a connection. Uh, and could talk okay. us through how uh, some of this work around water resilience and basin resilience uh, builds on to existing approaches uh, for water accounting and basin water management. Hi Jason, let's see how this goes. Hopefully it'll last for a few minutes. So starting with the definition as that's always a good place to start. What we're talking about here when we mention water accounting is really the systematic study of the status trends in water supply demand, accessibility and use, which really enable the quantitative assessment of the state of the water resources within a system. And that could be a geographic region over a particular period of time. It could be at the national level. Now, water accounting is not a new discipline. The term water accounting is probably newer than the actual tools and methods used. And it's frequently conducted at utility or the urban level with well-established approaches. But these are rarely linked to the river basin. So we rarely see water accounting linked across scales. And in the past, for example, we see a lot of individual water infrastructure, which has typically been considered without placing it within the context of the entire river basin on which it depends. Due to the nature of water, it's static, it flows, it moves across the basin, and the fact that it can be reused within a river basin by different stakeholders at different locations, sometimes multiple times, means that understanding the availability and quantifying the supply and demand at the point of use is not sufficient. And really what's critical is to, to place that within the broader context and to understand the availability, variability and use at the broader basin scale. So while characterizing the water system and system state through a water balance, that's the second definition on the slide and that little schematic is well established through those various parameters. And depending on the scale, typically with data inputs from monitoring networks where these are available or combined with some form of hydrological modeling. What we don't see much of is this being done on a regular consistent basis with reporting beyond that central water system and also within that beyond the basic water balance parameters themselves through a consistent and coherent set of indicators. 
So which then really enables us to look at the temporal and spatial variability over a longer time period, bringing in water quality and access, the ecological attributes that Fred mentioned, or environmental flows. And this is what very rarely occurs. And while various different water accounting approaches exist at the moment, and in some countries are applied routinely at the national level, so we see the UNCO, the System for Economic Water Accounting, um, for accounting for water, we see the Australian national system. These all require reliable and consistent data across scales. And at the basin scale, this really is a challenge in many parts of the world due to both the lack of in situ monitoring networks or where these exist due to the lack of access to the data which is needed to, to fill the water accounting. But with recent developments in particularly earth observation sensors and data availability, big advances have recently been made in water cycle science and it's been demonstrated and is increasingly widely accepted that accurate measurements of these key water balance parameters such as evapotranspiration, precipitation, uh, storage can be derived from satellite data. And because of the improvements in technological and computing capabilities, the application and reliability of using these data sets in hydrological studies is constantly increasing and becoming more and more common. And over the past few years, the increasing availability of these types of data has really dramatically changed our ability to quantify water resources and related parameters across different scales. And if you go to the next slide, please, Ashon. So at IMI, for example, we're working with a remote sensing-based water accounting framework, which characterizes the broader water system, placing water quantity into space and time in the context of the types of users and uses, which, and which also recognizes the environment as a user, which is really a key feature for looking at the basin scale and at the overall system. It then enables you to quantify the amount of water remaining in the domain for further use. And because it relies on globally available satellite data, water accounts can be produced for any basin in the world using a consistent set of indicators. And due to the spatial nature of the data, we can add in additional indicators as hydrological activity, water-related processes such as precipitation, recycling, and others that uh, Fred mentioned in his previous slides. So in terms of where next from here, I guess in terms of the bigger picture, water accounting really needs to become much more commonplace. It's not a one-off exercise and shouldn't be seen as such. And we're working at IMI to address this through various initiatives, for example, at the continental scale in Africa through a Digital Earth Africa initiative, which is a data cube of Earth observation-based analysis-ready data, on top of which we build a suite of water applications, including water accounting. And in terms of what we're doing with this initiative, aligning water accounting at the utility or, stake or stakeholder level through um, a uh, more common and comprehensive water accounting framework that links to basin resilience and stakeholder resilience is really what needs to be done, a more comprehensive accounting framework that links across these two scales. So identifying pilot locations, understanding the system, linking to indicators uh, of measures of basin resilience, and in particular in terms of the ecological variables and governance are really where we need to go with this. So Great. I'll just end by saying that understanding how a basin, water basin behaves not only leads to better water management, but really is also essential to safeguard the environment. And through a coherent and consistently produced set of indicators, water accounting can really provide the information needed to inform the process, but really to drive a stakeholder dialogue around water resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Perfect compliment to uh, Fred's uh, prepared remarks. Um, before we go to this survey question, I'd like to turn to Colin and ask you to reflect a little bit about um, how this discussion today relates to some of the work that has uh, occurred through uh, WRI's efforts on water risk assessment um, that's done, uh, of course, to understand um, the way that a stakeholder can evaluate uh, relative levels of water risk. You have a few remarks for us, Colin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll try and keep succinct just for purposes of time, but I'd like to make three points from the corporate water stewardship angle. Um, first of all, if we just remind ourselves of the classic process that WRI and others go through with businesses that are working their way along the corporate water stewardship maturity curve, there's three steps you could say. 
uh, you start off with some risk diagnostics, water risk assessments, et cetera, and then you move, um, and that's usually done at a global or portfolio level with resources such as Aqueduct. Uh, and then second, you would move on to strategy, targets, and policy, so some sort of guiding document at internal um, and potentially public uh, resources that are really saying this is where we're going and this is where we want to end up. And then you get down to more of the implementation in priority locations. So I think it's useful to contextualize what we're talking about today really sits with and expands upon that third bracket there of the more local activities that are really drive the right type of risk response behavior that you're looking for. Um, and that's where we're really trying to focus today and also where uh, I imagine this framework will fit in most, most appropriately. Um, so just a bit of clarification there could sit alongside other things such as contextual water targets, et cetera. Um, the second thing I wanna point out is that there's a variety of ways that businesses tend to respond to water challenges. Um, some may make quantitative targets that are driving towards, um, you know, driving towards risk reduction. Some may make moonshot targets that are really ambitious and say, well, we know that if we set a target that is vastly beyond um, where, we are, where we maybe think that we can get to, it will drive the right type of behavior. This, I would say, uh, well, not a target, but if, it, if a target, uh, if a pro approach were attempted to be adopted here, this would fall underneath the process-oriented approach. So rather than having some sort of enterprise-wide KPI that's driving a certain type of behavior, the process and outline that Fred gave us earlier, this is really a local process that requires stakeholder engagement, that requires understanding the right type of variables in the basin that you're operating in, and not necessarily building upon um, the, the global hydrologic data sets, et cetera. Uh, and then the third point, and I think that this is probably the most important and the biggest shift, is that um, we, this is an expansion of scope in terms of the uh, operations and, and uh, breadth of water stewardship. So what well, I'd point out, um, interestingly, the word footprint hasn't been mentioned today yet. That's because usually when we think about the most advanced businesses and we think about corporate water stewardship, those who we consider to be most advanced are the ones who are, generally speaking, most adept at responding to their impacts and their footprint, whether that's operations or supply chain. But what we're trying to do here is really expand out the scope and say, well, yes, your operations are important, but we're really looking at these basin resilience metrics. We're not looking at the individual stakeholder resilience metrics, we're looking at what would allow for basin resiliency. And I think that's a fairly important expansion of scope in terms of the objectives of this project. Uh, in addition, I would say, um, in addition to expanding the scope out into more of the basin focus and less of the uh, company focus, there's also an expansion of what to look at. So the, the underlying factors that cause water stresses and shocks and the responses to those on a basin level, that is more specific and more uh, underlying than say just quantity related. So like hydrologic connectivity, et cetera. These are, these are, uh, these are metrics that drive resiliency and traditionally have not been reviewed and responded to by businesses to the same degree as we are proposing here. So that is the expansion of scope, um, you know, away from business operations towards the basin perspective and also an expansive scope to look at drivers and other aspects of water stress and water resiliency, as opposed to the more traditional water accounting metrics, which um, we just discussed. So where to That's from here? Yeah, let's, so uh, where let's hold it there and let's take the, okay. uh, the next steps as the uh, second piece that John can pick up, perhaps, um, cognizant of time, uh, Colin. Great. What I'd also like to suggest we do is perhaps a, uh, a little bit of an agenda repair. We got one more survey question and then John, just giving you a heads up that um, the degree to which uh, your concluding remarks, uh, if you can incorporate what your reflections might be on the results of this survey uh, instrument, uh, this survey uh, question we're about to do, we'd welcome you to incorporate that into any uh, reflections that you might have. So let's pull the third question up. And as uh, you, you're taking a look at it, I'll just narrate a little bit. And this has been the subject of uh, quite a bit of discussion within the Project Partner Consortium. Uh, and it's really how we would think about the relationship between individual stakeholders and their resilience within a basin. And the, the resiliency of the basin as a whole. And there's two different ways that you can think about this. We've tried to make it, even though it's a fairly complex question, we've tried to make it as simple as possible. 
One is this orientation around the stakeholder resilience ultimately adds up to basin resilience and uh, it's necessary for stakeholders to be resilient in order for the basin to achieve resilience. And the other is the concept flipped the other way that no resilient uh, stakeholders cannot be uh, resilient unless the basin system as a whole is resilient uh, and therefore uh, stakeholders are subject to the overall system itself. And of course, the last option, if we've just thoroughly confused you, is you have no idea and you can uh, let us know that as well. So let's give you a couple of minutes uh, to weigh in on this uh, perspective. And then John, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn over to you immediately after to see if you can reflect on these results as part of your uh, synthesis. All right, let's see what we got. We can. Ah, split. It looks almost like the project team. Imagine. Uh, okay, so uh, clearly these two uh, interrelate to one another. Uh, there's probably not nice uh, bright lines that separate the two uh, as we recognize, but we wanted to get a sense of where, how people come at this issue. So. With that, uh, let's uh, do away with the uh, presentation slides and let's turn to John for uh, some of your reflections on uh, what you've heard uh, so far today and what you think that might mean for how we take this work going forward. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, my name is John Matthews. I'm with Agua, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. Uh, I, I've been given this uh, uh, special punishment of trying to uh, summarize and, uh, and find some next steps as well. Um, I'll start with the easy uh, issue, I, I think, which is what is it that, what's our, our problem statement here? There's a strong sense, I think, among a lot of us that the solutions that we've been proposing for how we manage uh, fresh water uh, are inadequate to the challenges that, that we are facing especially uh, climate change, but even new uh, forces, new instabilities uh, politically, uh, economically, uh, demographically are, are causing uh, uh, widespread disruption. Um, I think this was uh, a very well uh, described by Ashok in his talk, uh, making a contrast between how we think uh, resilience, which in, in my experience is a relatively new word, maybe two or three years old in the water community, um, between basin resilience and, uh, and, and this new uh, term, this new way of thinking around system resilience. Uh, uh, Fred went to the next level. He, he said, uh, in effect, uh, if we want different outcomes, if we want to have uh, uh, different processes that are in play, do we need to still keep using the same indicators uh, that we have used in the past uh, to measure um, if, uh, so different measurements perhaps will result in different behavior because we're tracking different things. And this quality of resilience is the elusive issue. And he specifically talked about uh, how uh, there are social, uh, uh, technological infrastructure uh, and governance variables that are really uh, critical to track. But we also need to understand, again, this idea of a system, how uh, ecology and hydrology uh, help define certain limits and often we have very limited control over uh, those, those limits and if we miss both sets of variables uh, or, or just one of them then we'll actually run into uh, some deeply prob problematic uh, issues. Uh, we certainly won't have a, a resilient outcome. Uh, Lisa Maria I, I think I gave a, a very effective uh, talk saying that even where we may not have uh, adequate records, that we actually have new tools that have been emerging uh, uh, that allow us to see uh, and, and communicate in a transparent uh, and neutral way where a system is and where it may be headed uh, to be able to think about, about the transitions that are, are coming to us. And, uh, uh, Colin, uh, I think, uh, uh, finished up uh, uh, very effectively by talking uh, particularly about, about businesses, this idea of, of uh, the, uh, the idea that um, concepts like water stewardship in many cases have 
uh, focused on a very narrow definition of, of problems. Um, and I would say by implication, they have come up with, uh, a, in some cases, very narrow types of solutions, such as a, a very strong emphasis on water efficiency and dealing with water scarcity. When, especially with climate change, we're facing a, a really much broader spectrum of issues. And in terms of next steps, uh, uh, I think the, the, the place uh, where I see in the survey results is that many of us are just starting this journey. Uh, we're just starting uh, uh, to, to uh, explore what resilience might mean for us in our individual work, uh, as well uh, as for our institutions and the basins and water systems in which we work uh, and live. But what I also see there is this implicit sense that uh, of, a, of a widespread dissatisfaction, uh, a sense that things that we have been doing are, are not working. That's really important. I think it's actually a really critical uh, and shared in intuition that we need to build on. Um, our, our, uh, uh, our, current, our current approaches are mismatched with the scale of, of the problems that we're facing, especially as our systems go from uh, trying to rebound uh, uh, from uh, impacts to actually being able to bounce forward into new states uh, through the process of transformation that we'll be going to in, in the future. In looking at, at some of the, the uh, questions that have, have appeared, I, I've been really struck about a couple of issues. Uh, uh, and I think these are critical for us uh, in terms of our next steps. Um, how do we develop this common vision across a basin, across a water system? What, do, what does that process really look like? We have some examples, uh, they, they weren't uh, really covered in the talks, but I think that there's a real hunger uh, to understand uh, how we articulate resilience and practice as something that's different than what we have uh, uh, been doing. Really shifting from fixed targets to more process-oriented targets. Second, uh, how intensive is, a, is the process of resilience? Is it, uh, is it computationally intensive? Is it governance intensive? Uh, uh, is, it, is it really a matter of data that we're missing? Um, uh, I think that needs to be more clearly articulated. I have my own answer, but I think that was something uh, that we need to really explore. And then lastly, uh, the way that we have traditionally focused, and I think this goes right to uh, Colin's statement, the way that we've traditionally focused on sustainability around water is we define very clear, very fixed targets, and they're very, very focused on the individual stakeholders. But uh, the, this, this revolution, really, uh, it, uh, that we're suggesting here is something that starts at a basin and interacts uh, with the individual stakeholder, and it focuses on moving targets. It focuses on process and measuring process itself. We probably still need some of those fixed targets, but we also really need to be able to focus uh, on, uh, on, on these process variables. And that is clearly something that needs to be expanded uh, and clarified. Thank you very much. I'm really grateful to have uh, played this role. Fantastic summary, John, really appreciate it. So we are at full time. Uh, if I can ask for the final slide, there's a URL there for where you can find more information and also an email address for our project lead, uh, Ashok's uh, um, uh, email address. Uh, why don't we pull that last uh, slide up before we do the survey itself. Um, and so people can see um, where they can get more information on this. This last exit uh, um, survey, just wanted to get a gauge from you on whether this, uh, this uh, undertaking that we're embarking on is, is resonating for you and whether you think it fills a gap. Um, we don't have enough time to uh, digest the results of this survey uh, together as a group, but we'd really appreciate your feedback on this question before you sign off. I wanna thank um, my uh, colleagues uh, on this uh, panel today for uh, attending and sharing uh, our work together. Uh, looking forward to bringing the work forward. I want to also acknowledge and appreciate uh, the people that took time out of their day to be with us today. Uh, I hope you will be able to engage in this work as it unfolds in the coming years. Uh, so thank you all and uh, good luck with the rest of St Stockholm World Water Week at home. I hope there are many fruitful sessions for you over the course of this week. And I'm going to just sit here waiting for folks to take this survey before they sign off. But 
Um, this is, uh, once you've done the survey, um, I encourage you guys to move on to your next meeting. And um, thank you again for being here. All right. Thank you all and uh, take care.